Welcome back again. We're, this is the Nigerian Symposium for Young and Emerging Leaders on Robin Minds. I'm the host, Shea Oloa, for with you today. And we're welcome back to the studio with three guests, three dis distinguished guests, namely Mr. Samson Itodo, E.D. Yaga. We have Miriam Laushi from MDP. Hi. And also Mr. Martin Ob uh, Obono from the Advisory, Bird, uh, Advisory Board of Amnesty Inter International. Welcome to the show, and we'll be discussing making the government work, a topic that affects every single one of us, including myself in this room, well, very much all of us. So the Nigerian government is heavily dependent on oil, as we all know, and I would believe that we're looking for means and ways to diversify so as not to keep ourselves in a landlock. But I'd like to th throw this to, to you, Mr. Martin. How do you think, what, or what ways do you think would help Nigeria diversify more properly? Do you think we should shut down importation of various goods to, you know, to stir up innovation within the mines? Or, or what, what do you think should be done? We need to begin to look at agriculture. We also need to look at um, education because um, education actually forms one of the most, um, the highest, one of the most um, highest um, um, form of um, income for the United Kingdom itself um, because of foreigners coming in to um, get education in the UK. So we need to begin to look at a lot of other aspects. I am not totally going to be in support of shutting down borders 100% uh, because we are over 200 million people. And um, so far, our production capacity for whatever we intend to produce um, to make ourselves diversify uh, from other, uh, other parts of, uh, I mean, from oil to other parts of um, other sectors of the economy will be very, very difficult for us to sustain because we may not be able to sustain the production capacity. How, however, there might be a face to face of face-by-face -face, um, intervention. By now, we would have probably produced more doctors that would have been sent out just the same way Cuba has done in, the, in time past. So we need to begin to look in to do that diversification. But before we do that, we need to begin to have the right kind of people who will put up a plan that will make sure that such um, we don't just do a knee-jerk or a fire brigade approach towards diversification. So it's got to be a step-by-step -step approach, generally. OK. Uh, Mary. People and government interactions, right? Many people would say the government of today doesn't interact as much. Should interactions play a huge part in scoring success of the government? Absolutely. Um, I think Nigeria has grown. Um, the Nigeria we're seeing today is not the same one from a previous generation. The conversation was very difficult before, and we had a lot of, you know, student protests in a, in a previous era in Nigeria. Um, a lot of people didn't even know what the representatives in the National Assembly looked like. But today we have roundtable discussions with them. We have social media that gives us like direct access to them. And sometimes even if they're not online, the discussions that we have on social media reach them in their offices um, through other people, other channels. But they still hear about it and they tend to respond back. And so I think it's really important for interaction to be a part of it. Whether you're a president or a governor or a member of the National Assembly or the State House of Assembly, as long as you hold public office that is elective and you're, you have to account to the people, then interaction is important. As a representative of the, of the people, um, conversation between the people and the government is important. You cannot know what your people need if you don't have a conversation with them. It is very important to see this very conversational um, um, kind of governance going on right now. Um, I've seen a lot of people um, within the National Assembly. I think in recent times, we've seen people in the National Assembly um, bring out bills that young people were advocating for or women were advocating for, and ha they've had to discuss it based on public discourse. And as it is now, we have some questions of Zoom. So first question, how do young people contest political positions when policies and laws fight against people below 40 contesting for elections? The not too young to run bill has its own loopholes. Is there a way we can encourage younger people to stand up and contest positions? 
do you want to answer it? I don't know why you wrote <laughs> Well, how do we encourage young people? First, it's not about whether you're young or not. There has to be a clear understanding of what you want to do with political power. And for us in Nigeria, we need people who have capacity, who have character, who have competence to do what? To provide excellent public leadership. There's no need running for office if you have no plan on how to take people out of poverty. I think it's very, very important to underscore that. If we deal with that, we need to look at the processes. Today, you need to be a member of a political party to run for office. We've got 18 registered political parties. Um, the second pillar of the Not Too Young to Run bill was independent candidacy. The National Assembly passed it, but the State House of Assemblies d didn't pass it. So can we mainstream independent candidacy in our electoral process so it gives um, young people the opportunity to, to run if they don't want to be members of political parties? The, the, one of the things that we learned from 20, to the, the 2019 elections was even after the law, the age was reduced. And let me use this opportunity to say that only three offices um, were affected by the Not Too Young to Run law. Um, first was the age for the president was reduced from 40 to 35, for House of Reps from 30 to 25, and then for House of Assembly from 30 to 25. The, the age requirement for the Senate and the governors were retained at 35. So it's important to put this in perspective. And part of our position at the movement is you also need to review that to create more space. But even if you amend the law, the cost of politics is, is one of the greatest challenges that young people face. A lot of young people couldn't purchase the party nomination forms. Look at Edo and Ondo elections. How much do the major political parties charge people? For a piece of paper called party nomination forms, people were paying 22 million, 20 million. Now, for a country where if you look at, if you look at the median age, you, you look at our GDP, you look at our life expectancy, you look at unemployment rates, how do you expect? So it appears that public office is for the highest spender and the highest bidder. That is something we need to fix. Okay, well, what I could pick, you said something as regards uh, political parties not being democratic. Mm -hmm. So in a certain way, does it mean, does it, mean that some of these political parties when in power a reflection their government is a reflection of what their party of who their party is what their party stands for you know being a political party that brings out uh, a candidate and they don't even have the democratic process within themselves do you think it is a ref that is now tends to reflect on their mode of government structurally the foundation itself is weak when I forget about political parties are democratic institutions they are a reflection of a structural deficit that we have. And that is, what is public leadership? What is politics? Politics in Nigeria today is investment, it's business, it's an opportunity to settle inter elite wars. It's not about service to the people. So when people get into, and all the political parties are all the same, and the only difference is their logo and their names. But they are all the same. That's why they jump ship at, at will. You know, they move from one party to another and they are accepted, you know, with, with arms, with full arms and with pomp and pageantry because they are all the same. And we need to get to a point where our political parties themselves operate as development organizations. Because political parties don't just exist for contest for power. They are a platform for aggregation of social interest. How many political parties today aggregate social interest and engage um, the state or even mobilize people? How many political parties consult their members when their parties are going to select leaders or when they are selecting their candidates? None. The party guidelines, the party constitution, the party bylaws, they are all designed by a cabal within the parties because the people, the members, no party today, and I say this on authority, no party, particularly the major political parties, with updated, accurate register of members. If you doubt me, go and check. None of them. And what that tells you is the parties themselves and do not exist for the people. They exist for certain individuals who want, who have captured power, 
for their own personal interest and not for the collective interest of the people. And so if you want transformation, we've got to fix politics. We've got to disrupt our political parties. And I encourage young people who are very passionate and determined, go into those parties. That is where the revolution actually should start from. Okay. Oh, Mr. Martin, how do you think the synergy between the various layers of governments, being the executive, legislation, and judiciary, affect our system? You, you still find the kind of presidential interference in who becomes the House of uh, the Speaker of the House of House of Reps, the, the 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 Deputy Speaker to the Senate President, Deputy Senate President, and all other principal officers that you find, and this automatically entangles them because it is I who makes you who you are. So you still have to call to me and talk to me and tell me what I, I mean, do what I've told you. So. Despite the fact that the Constitution has guaranteed that level of separation, you still find the people, the caliber of people who are there, who don't understand why they are there, who don't understand the work they ought to do, you know, still entangling themselves, right? Pardon me. Uh, finding themselves in an entanglement that makes them to continue to make our democracy not to work as it should work. Okay. Okay. Uh, Miriam, I would. I would like if you could please state about two flaws you think that the that Nigerian government have and... Only oh, two. Well, let's leave because it's an open <laughs> question because I'm still going <laughs> to... I know you, you can go all day, but just two and two preferred solutions or solutions from your perspective on how you think they can be handled. Wow, that is like a difficult question for me because, I mean, on a daily basis, we see flaws you know within our government so i don't even know which one to pick from but i think um just based on some of the conversations that we've had today right i think institutions don't work and it's not it's almost in every sense we need our institutions to work and the truth is they don't work we are seeing scandals which explain to us why they don't work and there's a lot of corruption behind the behind and in front of people, there's a lot of corruption. And even the way corruption is dealt with, you know, is very discouraging. It almost looks as if you can do it and get away with it and nothing is going to happen. For me, I feel there has to be, there must be harder consequences, more intense consequences for corruption. There has to be a quicker way to deal with it. You find somebody will go to court and they'll be in court for years over a corruption case, by the time the, the issue is resolved, you know, it's not even relevant anymore. The money can't even be found anymore. There has to be a way where they can quicken the process and the institutions that um, prosecute um, corruption. Okay. Um, clearly, people will say that Nigeria is not working. As of right, the Nigerian government is not working. I would, I would say it is working to a certain degree, I would say it's not working to a certain degree. Yeah. But based off your personal opinions, what do you think is Nigeria, what do you think Nigeria's scorecard is, is looking like right now? Like, on a scale of, let's say, one to 10, or should we use 100%, I mean, the percentage for, how, how well, what do you think the scorecard is like? I think for me, on a scale of one to 10, I would honestly say 3.5. And the reason I'm saying this is even if Nigeria works, it only works for a few. The majority of Nigerians, the average Nigerian, is not living a good life. They don't have access to good health care. They don't have access to good education. They don't have access to anything that you know, the government is supposed to provide. Electricity, what works? You know, there are certain achievements that we can say, you know, different administrations have, have, you know, noted and done. But is Nigeria working for the common man? No. Within the past few years, they've told us that um, we are the poverty capital of the world. About over 90 million people are living in extreme poverty. Is that a country that works? No. Because we shouldn't be living in a, we shouldn't be comfortable in a place where People are dying, it's insecure, people are hungry, people don't have medical care, and because some of us are comfortable, we, we sit back and we think Nigeria is working. If Nigeria is not working for the average man, Nigeria is not working at all. And until these things are fixed in a way that 
a person is born and from, from the hospital there's good maternal care so that because our maternal mortality is very high until a person is born and they have good medical care from childbirth, they're able to go to school even if they're not rich, they're able to um, get a good education and have these basic things that make life worth living and comfortable enough to live, then I can't say that Nigeria works and that's why I have to give it a 3.5. Um, it's a reflection of how Nigeria has been over the past 10, 15, 20 years. And so it's definitely something that um, I feel like anybody in a leadership position should look at and realize that policies must work for these people. And when, when they start working for the general public, the average Nigerian, then we can start to say, okay, Nigeria is working. Okay. Um, first of all, I would like to go back before because I, I was trying to get the name of what the National Assembly does. It's actually the resolution of either the Senate or the House of Representatives. So that's what it's called okay. um, to either someone, anybody else. So, um, I think uh, you're quite ge generous with your, um, <laughs> your marks. <laughs> I would like to be your student. <laughs> I think Nigeria, to me, is actually below 1%. Oh, we're in a deficit. Yes. <laughs> That's wow. if I were to score Nigeria. Okay, so for example, let's, talk, let's, let's start young people, right? So let's even take the COVID pandemic as an example. Yeah. Young people were supposed to be in school. All over the world, their counterparts are doing online education. What's happening to Nigeria? Students are at home, pupils are at home, tertiary institutions at the most, you know, are still at home. And then look at women, how are women treated in Nigeria? What is the level of justice system for women? Um, we recently carried out a research on, on rape alone, just rape in Nigeria, and we realized that out of the 257, um, 74 women that were raped in Nigeria, only nine convictions were secured. Now, um, you talk about the aged. How does the government treat its old people? There are millions of Nigerians who are retired, and they are, in pension, they are, they are on pension, but the majority of them haven't received their pension, and they don't receive pension. I can go on and on, you know. So, like the roads, is it electricity? So, at what point are you going to actually rate Nigeria to say we have scored? What are what indices on what basis are we going to say Nigeria has has improved? Look at the way justice system is done. Justice system, the justice is for the highest bidder basically, and it's all about power. So, a woman was um, hounded in a house um, some days ago. A governor came to use a mighty power to come and rescue her. So the institutions don't work. It's all about people. When the institutions are, ought, ought to be the ones to protect you, so it is now about power also, about individuals, about personalities. So at the end of the day, what if she was just, she didn't have a governor, she didn't know the governor? <coughs> what if <coughs> she couldn't reach the governor or the governor doesn't know her? What if she was just a normal person like me, you know, who can't call anyone? All right. So at the end of the day, you, you, you begin to ask the level of rights even in the country, okay? The citizens, how do citizens access rights? On a daily basis, people can't report to the police about abuses. They rather report to individuals, the segalings of our time, and the police is there. You report a matter to the police station, and the police tell you, get away, go away, get us full, give, give us this for us to be able to handle your matter. So at what point, on what basis, do you want me to rate Nigeria above 1%? When everything that we ought to have used, all the indices that we should use to, to, to say, okay, we are doing well in this country, or we are doing it, we can improve here, or we can, you know, they're all failing. Mm -hmm. So for me, Nigeria is doing less than 1%. Oh, wow. Mr. Samson. No, I, I completely agree with them. I, I, it's just that, yes, Nigeria is not working, but Nigeria, should Nigeria work? The answer is yes. Can it work? Yes, it can work. And that's why over the last couple of minutes, all the discussions here, we've, we've not just you know, performed diagnostics of our, of our problems, we've also proffered solutions. We've talked about how to make Nigeria work, we've talked about institutions, we've talked about the quality of our politics, we've also talked about you know, the citizenry, um, political education, and the need for more organizing. So, I completely agree with Martin and, and, and uh, Laoshi, Mariam, that the country isn't working, but it can work. 
and it takes this kind of difficult conversations held with those who are in positions of power and really changing their paradigm on, 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 on leadership. But Nigeria can work and should work. And the responsibility um, of making Nigeria work is our responsibility. The leaders who are benefiting, and Maria makes a strong point that the country is working for a microscopic few. Now, what we need to do is to disrupt that so that it can work forward for everybody. And it is possible because other countries have, have done it. Okay. Thank you very much, distinguished guests. We really appreciate it. I will be coming to your school so that I can get that score. <laughs> right? I don't think I don't think my mask going to be very no, 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 no. <laughs> But yeah, thank you very much for your contributions, your, oh, your words of wisdom. Um, hopefully the Nigerians at home will be able to pick up your words and know the ways to apply themselves to the solutions of the country mm -hmm. moving forward. And everybody at home, stay tuned. We'll be back again with yet another topic and another set of dignitaries to share some more light on the state of the country.